listen about particles, quantum physics, and even artificial intelligence. But how does it really work or affect our lives? Today, Dr. Sue and I, we both are going to make the science behind it edible for everybody. Así que, toma pulque y come nopal, el pulque podcast va a comenzar. It's my pleasure to welcome to this space, Dr. Sue. Dr. Sue, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> welcome to, to the Pulque Podcast. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for your invitation. No, no, no. It's, it's, uh, it's our honor for you to be here. Uh, doctor, how would you describe yourself? I would describe myself as a people, it's a person who uh, loves travel in the world and enjoy delicious food. Yeah. Wonderful uh, uh, tourist uh, area and also uh, enjoy doing the interesting science. Okay, uh, if you like to travel, which places have you been to? I travel a lot of places. My, my first uh, visit uh, uh, outside Taiwan is uh, Japan. Okay. Yeah, and that really uh, made me feel um, the uh, looking for a, 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 a career that I can uh, do travel and also doing science uh, uh, together. And... This uh, put me into a party of physics area. So starting from Japan, then I travel to uh, America and Canada and travel to Europe. And okay. I visit the kind of half of the European countries of the world. Yeah. And all of this travel is because of research conferences and things like that? Yes, yes. And many of them because of uh, the uh, conference. So, so then I have a good uh, reason to go. Yeah. Um, the, in, the most important thing is that um, uh, if you work in this field and you arrange a conference visit and you have a uh, good reason to uh, arrange for business uh, reimbursement. Yeah, you're like, <laughs> yes, I need to go to New York to a conference. Let's go one week. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, doctor, but I saw that you studied your bachelor's and your master's degree here in NTU. Exactly. Okay, uh, how was it and how was the change for you to go to the United States, for example? Right, so I, I pursued my bachelor's degree in Taiwan yeah. as a physics major. And studying for my junior year, and I started doing the research. So at that time... Uh, I work with uh, Professor Pao Ti Chang and uh, Professor Wei Su Ho in Felix uh, Department in Taida. Are they still here? Yes, yes, oh. yes, yes. Yeah, and Professor Pao Ti Chang right now is the department chair in uh, Felix in okay. Taida. So um, I, uh, I'm looking for an area that um, I can try to test the knowledge frontier of our understanding of the universe. Yeah. So um, the Henry Felix Lab in Taita offer opportunity to study the uh, 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 one of the uh, uh, amazing particles is called beauty particles. The beauty particles, they can resolve an uh, important puzzle, how the universe can be dominated by the matter. And in, most importantly, they offer opportunity for me to uh, work in Japan in uh, Tsukupa city. Okay. It's uh, about 60 kilometer uh, close to uh, Japan, uh, close to uh, Tokyo. So uh, start from there, I, I realized, oh, this would be a, a dream career if I can continue uh, doing the travel and also uh, doing the research yeah, to understand in the universe. And promoting science. Exactly, exactly. And then, um, I kind of uh, want to explore a little bit different type of the physics. In beauty physics, we try to study most precise measurement in the world. And I want to look for different approach, try to use the facility, use the highest energy ever, so-called energy frontier in the uh, world, try to uh, discover uh, new physics. What is this energy frontier? This the energy frontier in my time um, to pursue my PhD yeah. is uh, uh, accelerator located in US. That's the reason why I moved to US. Okay. Right. It's called uh, Tevatron. A Tevatron is um, accelerator 
around um, year uh, 2000, at that time, that, that would be the, uh, the highest energy frontier. Of course, um, uh, the, it's already a couple years of uh, operation for uh, Tevatron. So uh, they discover one of the heaviest uh, quark in the center model. It's called top quark. Top quark. Yeah, back to 1995. And when I did my um, bachelor degree. Okay. So I, I did know this accelerator, uh, but just at that time, when I studied in Taida, and the, the group involved in the beauty physics, not the tough physics. So um, a after a couple years of uh, beauty uh, research, I decided um, it would be interesting to explore different type of research. Then I moved to the top physics. Yeah. Uh, are these beauty particles? <laughs> Are they related to the um, to the detector that is called Bell? Exactly. Because it has something to exactly. related. Exactly. So right. It's a Bell experiment. The yeah. detector is named Bell, yeah, and the exactly. particles you find are called beauty, beauty particles. Particle. Exactly. What are these particles? Like which ones? Are them leptons? No, no, no. Um, so beauty particles here is a quark. It's, okay. And it has another name called button quark. Yeah. The um, button and beauty quark are particles that have a relative uh, uh, short lifetime. So when they are produced, they will decay. Yeah. Yeah. And the um, beauty particles, um, the, the way that uh, it behave have a feature that the antiparticle of the beauty quark, they could have... Uh, study different behavior from the beauty particle itself. Okay. So study the difference between the beauty quark, anti-beauty quark, how they decay to the uh, uh, stable particles, allow us to study the difference between particle and anti-particle. And with a precision understanding of that, have a chance to resolve the mystery why the universe is dominated by the matter. Do every particle have this Antiparticle? Exactly. Okay. Every part of antiparticle, electron, there's an anti-version of electron called partitron. Proton also could be built of the uh, uh, anti-quarks, then you could build anti-proton. Okay. And actually at CERN, they have a successfully assembled molecule. They have anti-hydrogen. They take oh. an anti-electron, yeah. anti-proton, put together, you can make the anti-matter this way. And doctor, maybe it's not very your field of research, yeah. but do you know what's the difference between normal hydrogen that we know, H2, yeah. and this anti-hydrogen? Anti do you know like the differences? The only difference is that uh, uh, every single constituent of anti-hydrogen is anti-particle. But okay, if you okay. really talk about the chemistry property. Chemical or Chemi physical property. Exactly. Like wake, they should wake. be the same. They should be the same. They should be the same based on the standard model. Okay. Right? Okay, okay. So um, th this is the reason why from the theory, they supposed to behave the same. But in reality, whether that be true, they could have a tiny difference. And maybe because of this tiny difference. And in the end, through the long history of the evolving universe, you can lead to the modern universe that is matter dominant. Yeah. We can talk about the standard model and this is small difference. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Doctor, uh, so the beauty particles in yeah. the building detector was part of your master's degree. Exactly, right. How about your doctor's degree, doctorate degree, PhD degree, well, mm -hmm. in the United States, where right. did you... Uh, study and what was the main the main topic? Right. So um, I switch from the precision frontier, which is the precision measure of beauty, to um, so called energy frontier physics. Try to pursue the highest energy of the accelerator in Fermi Lab in Tevatron. So that's where the accelerator is. Okay. And the institute uh, who involved in this accelerator. Uh, is the my target of the PhD application, and I uh, pursue my PhD degree in U University of California, San Diego. Yeah. But I only spend uh, less than a year time in San Diego 
then uh, I spend most of my time in Fermi Lab, Fermi which Lab. is about 60 miles away from Chicago. So you went from down south to a little bit north, right? Exactly, right. Well, uh, in, it's uh, close to the center of the United States. Oh, okay, okay, right, okay. Right, right, yeah. Okay, and doctor, uh, after your PhD, mm -hmm. let's say you are here right now in Taiwan, mm -hmm. you are a professor from National Tsinghua University, right? Right. And still professor from Chicago. No, no, no University of Washington. Washington, right. yeah, that's right. And um, I, like, I was looking at it, and what's the difference between like visiting professor and maybe associate professor? Like, mm -hmm. what are these differences? Sure. So, uh, currently, I'm a, a, a faculty in University of Washington in Seattle. Yeah. And I apply for sabbatical leave. It's um, a, a good thing also for the faculty job. Every seven years, you can take one year of the vacation. Okay. And uh, this uh, vacation is a special. It's called sabbatical leave. And you could uh, do anything you want in this one year. You can take a uh, vacation, you can use this time to write a book, and you can develop a course material that you, you were thinking about, but you just have no time to do that. Postponing. You can use this one year to <clears throat> dedicate on, on this. And you can uh, recharge yourself and try to have a f f uh, refresh your mind, and you can uh, perhaps brainstorming new ideas during this one year time. Every seven years. Uh, Every seven year, you have a one year time, you can try to arrange that, yeah. You, so, go ahead. Excuse me. Yeah, then what I'm thinking about is that to uh, uh, use this opportunity to uh, spend one year in Taiwan. So I arranged this uh, sabbatical uh, leave about one and a half years ago. Yeah. And I go through all the applications and I, have a very uh, good collaboration with uh, National, Tsinghua, National Tsinghua University. Yeah. Then uh, I arranged this trip uh, to uh, visit yeah. uh, National Tsinghua University. So currently I'm a formal faculty in the University of Washington. And Wait, I also I have a, a joint title as yeah. a visiting associate professor in National Tsinghua University. Okay. Yeah. And uh, in Tsinghua, is it where you are... Um, Research, doing research about uh, phaser and the particles in the dark universe, or is it in Washington? Right. So um, I continue to pursue energy frontier, and yeah. Tabatron shut down um, because of the rising of the Large Hadron Collider, which is the current energy frontier yeah. in the world. And I have a primary research program using this uh, large hadron collider to search for new physics. I have a collaborator in National Tsinghua University try to uh, work on the same experiment. It's called Atlas experiment. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah it's one of the experiments discovered the uh, uh, Higgs particle in Insert. year 2012, exactly. So even though I personally uh, visit Taiwan, my postgraduate student, they are in the United States, and we quite often travel to CERN yeah. in order to use the facility at CERN to do a new physics search. So um, basically, um, we utilize the uh, remote uh, education and remote research uh, technology a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. And <laughs> doctor, may I ask, uh, is this, you use Atlas in, at CERN, right? Exactly. And what does phaser mean? Phaser. Yeah, phaser yeah. is a... Uh, uh, and how are, are yeah. these projects related? Right. So um, in addition to Atlas, yeah. and which is my primary research program, and I start thinking about um, the new directions to identify particles that cannot be searched using Atlas detector. Okay. And this uh, initiated the uh, involvement into phaser. Okay. Phaser is a stand for four search experiment at Large Hadron Collider. It's a completely different detector from Atlas. Okay. The 
common thing is that they are using the same uh, proton proton collisions. Yeah. But proton th- like the same collider. They use the same collider and the same collisions. Yeah. Uh, but put detector in completely different location. Oh, so then okay, you, you have a okay. way to probe different type of the new particles. Because what type of particles are these? Are they um, neutrinos? They, because you said they are um, weakly interacting particles. The, yes. So the the new particles, and I have come along why I have a motivation to search for new particles. Yeah. Right. So... Um, Part of physics have a long history with a success to understanding the building block of the universe and also how do they interact. You can think about the universe is literally very similar to the concept of Lego. You have a the different Lego. Lego pieces. Yeah, yeah. Using Lego pieces, you can build the different architecture, oh, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. We, in the nature, Almost everything you see so far behaves just like that. You can literally try to find what's the fundamental building block. Yeah. You can build everything. So we know that uh, we have quarks and electrons. You can use that to build the matter. Yeah. But how can you build things together? So they have to do the interactions. And you can think about once you put the Lego together, they can easily break apart. But you can use the glue to stitch things together. Okay. Then it's then you can build a larger, stronger ma- material, material, right? Material, yeah. It's very. It's the same idea. In our nature, we have uh, four fundamental force allow these uh, quarks and leptons to interact with each other. Glue. Right. So uh, when you have a stronger force and strong force is yeah. the force to in, allow the quarks to binding together. together. That's how you in can the build that. Right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So then you can use the EM force to allow charged particles talk to each other. That means you can use the electron and uh, the, uh, the proton. They both have charge. They can interact with each other using electromagnetic force. And that's how you can build hydrogen. So yeah. uh, through such uh, operations, you can build the whole universe. Then in the SNAP model, we predict 17 particles. Okay. And we can use that to explain almost every daily operation uh, phenomenon you can, you can describe. But except uh, we start realizing that um, uh, the universe is composed of uh, the material you, you are uh, aware of familiar with and this material actually only occupy four percent of the whole universe four percent only Only four percent okay so uh, most of the universe is composed of uh, dark energy dark energy and more than 75 percent and then um about 22 percent ish is uh uh, compo is about the dark matter and the one we really familiar with is only 4%. So we actually have very little thing to know about the whole universe. Yeah. And what is dark matter? What is dark universe? We don't know. And dark matter, we call it matter. And that means it could have a similar property as matter, but it's just invisible to us. Yeah, yeah. Right? So one nature way to explain what dark matter is, is new particles. Because yeah, we, we have started to uh, get familiar with the uh, idea and being a su- successful support from understanding the cinema model. It's uh, uh, down to the earth that uh, can be described by point particles. Perhaps dark matter is also some type of the particles. This is a very, very uh, big puzzle. Yeah. It's one of the top priority of the science uh, problem we need to address by human beings in 21st century. Yeah, so I I try to use the large hexagon collider as a facility to study potential uh, existence of those new particles. Oh, because dark matter is weakly interacting 
with the electromagnetic force that you just said that it, it, we could call it EM force. Right. And um, this dark dark matter, it, there's a complete universe in there, right? Yeah. Because there would be antimatter, mm -hmm. anti dark matter. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, so? that's a good point. Yeah, you build a dark matter from the symmetry yeah. of the fundamental law. There's no reason have no anti dark, dark matter. matter exactly. Oh, yeah. Okay, and uh, which so far which with which particles are you working with? Let's mm -hmm. say what is like your raw material of it? Yeah, yeah. So um, if you talk about type of dark matter, th there are many many interesting and exciting theories yeah. predict different type of dark matter. And we don't know which one is correct. So the way to do, res to do science is that once you have a hypothesis based on a theory, yeah. you can make a prediction on the behavior of uh, such a theory. Then as an experimentalist like me can design experiment, try to test those uh, ideas. So currently I'm looking for dark matter. Yeah. We call it dark because uh, uh, you cannot see it using the uh, optical device. Yeah. That means they, they have no uh, interaction with the photon or the electromagnetic interactions. And they could have uh, their own interaction in the so-called dark sector. So there there's a, could be a dark universe. That is a universe with uh, a lot of the uh, dark matters and also the interactions among them yeah but just not interact with our normal matter right so uh, we have a theory can predict this uh, dark sector could have a mediator to make a connection between the dark sector and the, the normal matter visible right yeah we only know how to detect matter we only know how to operate um the facility with matter yeah so we need to use uh, our known material to probe the dark sector so um currently i work on a particle called the dark photon dark photon right so it has a property very similar to photon yeah but it has additional coupling enable this uh, dark photon interact with dark matter. Okay. And dark photon can also have uh, mixing with our normal photon. Now you can imagine there's a bridge. Yeah, yeah. Connect between the dark matter and the, uh, the, the normal matter, right? So if I can find this uh, dark photon, it provide me a way to look deeper understanding the dark matter. So dark photon is similar to photon. Um, one of the things is that very different from photon, dark photon have, has mass. Yeah. And we don't know what's the range of the mass of this dark photon. It could be very light, maybe oh, just a okay. factor of two of the electron mass. Yeah. Or it could be very, very heavy. It could be 1,000 times heavier than the proton. Since we don't know what's the actual mass of the dark photon, we have to scan all range, right? Yeah. So if we use a atlas, we can only study heavy dark photon. Okay. Uh, you need dark photon, the mass is about factor of 20 uh, heavier than proton or above. That means if dark photon is uh, actually light below the proton mass, then you cannot use atlas to search for it. Okay, you need another one. You need other experiment to do that. Phaser is a dedicated uh, experiment can search for the dark photon less than the proton mass. Okay, so is it like the neutrino that we don't know its mass, but we know the mass difference? Mm -hmm. Is it like that? It's, it's different in a way, in a way that uh, neutrino have uh, uh, well-defined uh, properties. 
Yeah. That is, we know currently Cinemata predicts three different neutrinos, and we have an experiment understanding the mass difference between uh, different These neutrinos. N- neutrinos. Yeah. Through the oscillation of the flavor of yeah. the neutrino. Um, but dark photon, we know much, much little. Even dark photon concept itself is a theory, yeah, yeah. right? So um, there could be different type of dark photon. Yeah. And now we use the simplest assumption. If there's only one type of dark photon, and what would be the best research facility to search for this dark photon? And so... So now I'm using two different facilities. Yeah. For the heavier dark photon, I use Atlas. Okay. For the light dark photon, I use a phaser. Phaser. Yeah. Okay. And doctor, is this dark photon, uh, in how long time does it decay? It de- Or what is its lifespan? That's that's good questions. And again, this is um, uh, a question that uh, we don't know the answer. Yeah. We don't know pr- f- precise answer. But we have a theory predict uh, different uh, properties of a dark photon decay. Yeah. So dark photon can decay to electron position pair or the muon anti muon pair. Okay. So um, we can design a detector, try to catch the moment when dark photon decay to a uh, electron position pair. Electron and positron. Positron. Yeah, here. positron is the anti particle of electron. Electron, yeah, right. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, in particular, it's um, um, the idea of using different facility optimized for different properties of, to search for a new particle. It is a very, very important approach for yeah. science. Yeah, like they say, you are not going to use a telescope to look for an elephant, right? Exactly, yeah. right, <laughs> right, right. Okay, and then, doctor, um, how does artificial intelligence play a role in these discoveries of particles? The um, artificial intelligence already play important role to discover particle physics. Yeah. In 2012, there's a Higgs discovery by Large Hadron Collider facility through two experiments, Atlas and CMS. Yeah. The discovery of Higgs boson already used the artificial intelligence uh, algorithm. Yeah. Without the AI, you cannot claim discovery in his, uh, in, uh, you cannot claim his discovery in 2012. The reason is that the, the Higgs is actually difficult to produce. Yeah. And the, one of the golden decay channel we discovered Higgs is the decay of the Higgs to two photons. Ah, okay. Yeah. However, there are so many photons in our detector. We cannot discover Higgs without huge separation, cleaning up all the background. So those are the two photon process predicted from the center model, yeah. but not, not related to the Higgs boson at all. So we have to use um, the uh, process that uh, a hadron can be misidentified a photon. We call it a fake photon because they, the detector misidentify it as a photon. Yeah. So how can we suppress those uh, fake photon, just keep the pure photon itself? It's a major challenge. We use AI to help us to classify a true photon from a fake photon, original from hadrons. Okay. So What are hadrons? Hadrons are the uh, composed of either three quarks yeah. or one quark and uh, anti-quark. Okay. The famous example of a hadron is proton. The proton, yeah. Yeah, proton is composed of three valence quarks. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 don't worry, yeah. So um, the universe is actually uh, composed, at least the matter that the, 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 the ordinary matter we know about, they are mostly composed of hadrons because we are composed of proton and neutrons. 
those are all hadrons. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And doctor, then artificial intelligence have, of course, played a right. great role. You just mentioned. Right. And um, how how are these algorithms? Let's say. Right. Most of our audience are in university. So, what type of um, of program do you use right. in order for this AI? Okay. So, um, first, let me come on the algorithm itself. And as I commented earlier, that um, the AI algorithm have been used for the major discovery in part of Felix, for example, Higgs discovery. Yeah. And now we start applying more and more AI algorithm to uh, solve difficult computing challenge in paleophysics. The, the way how paleophysics uh, evolve is through the big science and big data analysis. Yeah. Because we are looking for particles rarely interact with normal particles. Yeah, yeah. The way to study them is you need to generate a huge abundance of data and maybe one of billions, yeah, yeah. maybe only one of billions of the data coming from the interesting new physics we are looking for. So we, we, we have to enhance the production rate of data. And that means we have much more computation we need to deal with. Yeah. Because of the revolution of the deep learning in AI algorithms, it opened a lot of uh, new ideas to compute the uh, particle physics data, to process particle physics data with a more uh, sophisticated way. And that also increased the usage of the, the computing hardware. Yeah. So we need uh, the algorithms to solve the problems. The one I just mentioned earlier is the identification problem. You want to identify a photon from truth photon, right? But you can also try to use AI algorithm to help you to speed up the simulation. Okay, yeah, yeah, of we, course. We have to do simulation based on quantum field theory and also new particle theory we predict at the subatomic level. And we use lots of simulation compared to our actual data from the collisions and use this uh, comparison of difference to help it understand what really happened at that subatomic scale. Yeah. So we have to generate more simulations in order to compare to the big collision data we produce. And this is a big challenge. We can use a generative model in AI algorithms to help us to learn how to simulate the data which can be uh, original from the first principle theory. Yeah. But if you want to really just do calculation using first principle theory, that's a, a huge computation, a lot of time. So yeah. we can use AI to learn how to generate faster. So uh, this is a generative model, the algorithm we used in uh, the paleophysics. Yeah. And we also have a, a lot of the calibrations that we need to deal with. The data that we handle with a lot of the readout channels and uh, the full detector. Yeah. So we have to learn how to do the regression problem to map the measurement of the electronic signal into the physical quantity that we are interested in. The interesting uh, physical quantity we want to deal with are the energy and momentum of particles, yeah. but the data we collected are, are not going to tell us uh, what's the for, uh, energy and momentum of particles. What we collected are digital uh, uh, signal pulse. It's clues. From, from the electronics, right? Yeah. So you need a regression process to, uh, to uh, map the uh, detection to the actual physical quantity. And it could be even like a translation, right? It's uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. The yeah. translation, um, in, in this particular case, we call it regression. Regression. Right? So um, we use the identification, regression, and generative model yeah. We try to embrace all the uh, uh, possible uh, breakthrough in the deep learning 
try to uh, apply that to the particle physics uh, yeah. problem, then this way we can speed up our calculation using the um, hardware accelerator. Hardware accelerator is a trend of computing. Yeah. And you could have a GPU with your uh, laptop. You can use that for all the graphical processing uh, intensive project. And we, we try to uh, catch up the trend from the uh, industry and technology, trying to speed up this calculation. Okay, Doctor, you just mentioned very interesting, uh, very interesting stuff. Yeah. So starting, uh, I'm gonna like you mentioned earlier the standard model, right? Then AI, and that you need to perform a lot of experiments. Uh, so you have a bunch of data mm -hmm. in order to to do this regression with AI, right? So as a conclusion, I would like to make you a question about a very recent re discovery in physics. Right. Um, about the mu and decay. Mm -hmm. That many people were saying, oh, it's going to break the standard model. <laughs> it's going to be like new physics is here. We right. need to change everything. And many other people like, were like, calm your horses down. It's not like that. It's just a very small possibility. So what do you think about it? I know it's not your field of research, but I would like to know your opinion. Yeah, I'm actually very excited about this uh, uh, new uh, breakthrough of the, the science result. Yeah. This is called the muon G-2 experiment. Yeah. Yeah, they just released a, a first publication um, this week. Yeah, yeah. So it's an experiment in a Fermi lab trying to study uh, this... Uh, gyro magnetic moment property of the muon. Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, they, this is already a, a quite a historical measurement yeah. for a couple of generations. And the uh, 20 years ago, the experiment in Brookhaven National Lab, they started the, this G-2 measurement and announced a result which have a strong evidence show that uh, uh, there could be a new physics hint from this measurement. Okay. So the G minus two, and why we care about that, this uh, G factor, this is um, the uh, uh, a property intrinsic to muon. Muon is um, a, a syllable of the uh, electrons. Yeah, it's, it's the older brother. Exactly, oh, it has okay. every single property of the same as the electron, except it's heavier. Yeah, Yeah, it has a different interaction with the Higgs, uh, Higgs it, boson. It, it, it has different interaction. So um, with the Higgs boson, Higgs boson can explain how particles get mass, including electron and muon. Yeah, yeah. And, but they could have the same mechanism, it's just a coupling strengths are different. Okay. So muon have a stronger coupling to the uh, Higgs, that's why it's heavier. Okay. Right? So... Um, People are surprised that uh, electron uh, have a special property called spin. Yeah. And this uh, G factor equals to two have a hint that the electron have uh, spin health properties and muon have the same. But it's not exactly G equal to two because of the uh, uh, these uh, uh, quantum corrections. The When muon, they move inside the magnetic field, it's not just moving, but it, it also have a, a, a precession. It, it can rotate around Angular the spin axis. Momentum, right? right. It's similar to uh, when you have a top, classical top, yeah, yeah. rotate on the table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you watch the top, it's spinning vertically originally, right? Yeah. Then later on, it starts wobbling. Yeah. So it's spinning and also wobbling around the rotation axis. And in quantum versions, and you can assign similar properties for the, the muon particles, okay? So what happened right now is that we know how to calculate this G minus two, applying the theory corrections, because when muon uh, process in the uh, uh, vacuum, they can emit the photon and then reabsorb photon. Yeah. This process introduced this anomaly uh, G factor into the 
uh, G minus two quantity. So 20 years ago, they measure this uh, experiment result is 3.2 sigma, a deviation from the theory predictions. 3.2 sigma would be like a difference range, a different size. It's a statistical um, uh, significance. Oh, yeah. So we have, in the part of physics, we already have um, kind of a standard regulation that is, um, in order to claim a discovery, uh, you need to achieve phi sigma. Okay. So um, 3.2 sigma is uh, quite, uh, I think it's 3.7 sigma. So yeah. 3.7 is a, uh, a strong evidence, right? And quite close. It, but 3.7 sigma to 5 sigma is actually quite a, a long way to go. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. Right. But if, if we, if, if this uh, new result claim 5 sigma discrepancy, that, that really a, a strong hint, of, that really uh, establish there must be a new Felix behind. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the the way how new phase come into this uh, G minus two measurement is G minus two calculation is through this vacuum fluctuation again, but you it's probably muon emit a photon, but then this photon might pop out new particle and anti new particles. Okay. Then they annihilate again, we are so back to the muon. And through introducing the new particles you could uh, explain this anomaly. That's why people get really excited. Yeah, and yeah. These, these new particles might be might have a very short lifespan. Right. right before we couldn't be able to right. measure it, right? And even interesting, we don't know what's the mass of this new particle. They could arrange they could range from a, a mega electron volt to thousand electron volt. So that means it could be just a few factor less than the proton mass yeah. or 1,000 heavier than the proton. It actually probe similar particle as an atlas in Large Hadron Collider. Okay. But the facility in, G, in the muon G-3 experiment in Fermilab can probe a range that you cannot probe using Large Hadron Collider. That is the lighter particles. Yeah, yeah. So it's very similar to my phase experiment. Atlas can study heavy dark photon, but Phaser. not like dark dark photon, right? Yeah, yeah. Muon G minus two can probe not just the heavy particles, but can also probe light particles. So you have a range of the new particles. You just cannot probe using large Hadron collider. Yeah. And and this uh, this multi uh, this uh, multi way approach to to test uh, new physics there. It's, it's really fascinating. So now this new result, why I'm so excited? Because it's been 20 years. There's no new, new update from this uh, 3.7 Sigma. Yeah, yeah. That's why everyone's starting to say, are you going to announce? And it was 20 years of research. Right, right? exactly. So yeah, it, it, it takes like uh, really t t a decade yeah. to, uh, to renovate the technology and to take everything ready. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of cross-check going on, a lot of... Uh, graduate students spend a hard, a hard effort trying to analyze those data, yeah. calibrate those data, understand the data, and now they have a result. So the new result enhance this uh, discrepancy to 4.2 sigma. Yeah. Right? So, and even exciting is that they just analyze a partial data set. That means they are going to comp continue analyze the rest of data yeah, provide yeah. The even higher precision, so because they know or they already know where to look for, right? They they uh, um, the new data will need more calibrations in order to engage into the uh, uh, the publish the first publication. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, the more data will help to improve the precision and have more comparison, right? Because the, the new result actually, if you compare to the nominal value, the yeah. nominal value compared to the theory prediction actually becomes smaller. Yes. However, they shrink the uncertainty. So that's why the significance of the uh, 
anomaly increase. Yeah. So so you can you can imagine if I try to measure a quantity, uh, uh, a length of a uh, an object, then I claim it's a uh, uh, one meter. Yeah. But this number actually means not too much if I don't tell you the uncertainty. If it's one meter plus minus one fifty centimeter. centimeter. Oh. Oh. It's yeah. You, you don't yeah, call yeah, it yeah, a, a yeah. large oh, like difference, right? <laughs> but if it's a one meter plus minus zero point one millimeter, then you can really claim the, it's uh, the, it's the, this length, right? Yeah. Right. So it's it's a similar case for this uh, uh, new result. The difference of the uh, between the experiment and theory itself become smaller. Yeah. But the uncertainty also shrink. Okay. So that's why the the statistical significance actually increase. Okay. And I, I'm I'm really uh, looking forward to see more data release in more the coming of the results, year. Right? Because they once they include more data and maybe they can uh, uh, even push this uh, uh, discrepancy close to the five sigma discovery boundary. Yeah. Yeah. That, that will be really a, a headline news for uh, over the world. And once this five sigma is reached, there's going to be a lot of work for physicians. Yeah. So <laughs> then it, it, now when you think about what, what really actually can be the new physics behind to, yeah. to probe it. And I can imagine that there will be a, a, a person of uh, all different uh, new ideas and, and also new proposals also. to try to crochet all these results, right? But I want to say that even though we are excited that um, the new result from uh, this uh, Geo Mio GMS collaboration, yeah. they they show this uh, nice uh, uh, update of data, and they the announcement uh, of the uh, the you know intention of this uh, anomaly become larger. But there's also uh, alternative uh, theories. Uh, try to oh, explain that yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they, when they use a different approach to account for this uh, uh, so-called uh, uh, hedronic uh, fluctuation corrections, yeah. they show the theoretical creation actually closer to their new experiment result. Yeah. So uh, I would say it's more than just an uh, experiment, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the chasing of this uh, uh, precision hunting, yeah. But also, uh, it's a theory to theory battle. Yeah, theory better. It's a battle between oh, theories. Battle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a battle between yeah. theories. Yeah, uh, the the alternative approach claim the calculations actually not too different from the experiment. So uh, yeah, I yeah, I, I think this is a, a very very good. Uh, uh, you know, evolve on the science. Experiment try to uh, improve the precision yeah. in the measurement itself, and theory also improve their calculation of the uh, skills. Yeah, they go together. To, exactly. Yeah. So you need to uh, use a lot of uh, uh, supercomputing uh, calculation for this uh, theory. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a, a very intensive calculations. Yeah. So this is very, I, I, this is very exciting. I want to say this without. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, doctor, thank you very much for coming and sharing with everybody your knowledge. We are really, really happy for your collaboration and coming here. So thank you very much. So thank you again for your invitations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So see you next time. Thank okay. you very much Bye -bye. for watching this episode. Like the video in case you liked it, and leave a comment below for further improvement of our content as well. If you like topics such as new technologies, research done in universities, or even wonderful stories of incredible people, subscribe to our channel. This is how you find us in social media. I want to give a special thanks to all my sponsors and team members. Y recuerda, toma pulque y come nopal que la próxima semana otro video.